Bad Religion. We're on part three of our series, Bad Religion. And today I'm going to be talking to you guys about the, um, the important change that needs to take place when we encounter Christ. You know, I know that I've talked to you guys about the issue with um, people that are judgmental, people that are critical, people that are bound by religion, and how overwhelming and constricting it is when we become a Christian and we begin to serve rules and we begin to be mastered by details of, you know, trying to live just right. Now, we, we have a nature as uh, a country, as we develop and as new generations come, the old generation or something that happened in generations before affect us and frustrate us, and so we often go to another extreme, okay? So, so in generations past, don't take this personal, but in generations past, um, things have uh, been seen, and it's, this is not the case, but things have been seen as constricting, as over-religious, as overwhelming, and Christianity has been seen as uh, a baggage or a ball and chain as opposed to freedom. And so, as opposed to seeing that and, and saying, okay, some shifts need to happen, in a lot of ways, we've swung all the way to the other extreme, and it's We've experienced Christ, and we've been set free, and God has done something marvelous, and it is a free gift, so I can do whatever I want. And that is just not the case. When the gospel hits us, when we experience the good news, it should change details about our life. We have taken a few of the truths about grace or the church in general in some ways, and they have distorted it, thinking that freedom means we can do whatever we want instead of seeing the beautiful freedom of living like God intended. I've heard it said this way before, God's grace sees me as I am, loves me as I am, and accepts me as I am, but by grace he doesn't leave me there. And so he embraces us. He welcomes us. When we find who we are and we discover our brokenness and our failures, Jesus comes to us and everything changes. We see the truth. We begin to read scripture and it reveals things to us that need to be adjusted, things that need to be changed. And, and there, there's a reason why the scripture tells us that we are born again or we are reborn because a big thing happens. The old life, what we were, who we were, what we were doing is no longer alive in us. And we are now a new creation, as the scripture says. And if that is indeed the case, God in his grace came to us. He came to us, but that same grace, that same God refuses to leave us in that condition, in that condition. And th this brings me to the next thought here. When our freedom, in our freedom from, we discover a freedom to. Now, I know I left those blank, but, but think about this for a minute, okay? In my freedom from... Addiction, okay, just throwing a word in there. In my freedom from addiction, I am now free to, okay? What is the free to? You, you Think about it. Ponder it. If I was once an addict, now I'm free to be liberated from that, to not allow substances to be abused in my body, and to, to experience the, the fullness in physical sense of what God wants to do in us. Since I am, now that I'm free, in our freedom, all right, in our freedom from sexual bondage, all right, in my freedom from that, we are now free to discover sex as God designed it, okay? Understand what I'm saying here, okay? When we are free from something, when God releases us from something, he is freeing us to something. 
when God helps us to break bondage, when God releases us, when God gives us a new life, he is releasing us from something, but it's not just releasing us from that something, he is giving us something, he's leading us towards something. We are freed from sin and its despairing grief. We're freed into his love and its invigorating hope. We are freed into living life as it was intended. We're freed into experience every single one of God's promises. We're freed from sin and we're freed to be good or be righteous or to live right. Righteousness seems like so far away. Righteousness seems like an impossibility. And we're unable to grab it by merit. It is Christ dying on the cross that gave us his good or his righteousness. And as I've shared with you guys before, it is not an earned gift. It's given to us. So if God says, I love you, and you don't have to earn that. In Jesus Christ, I love you, okay, We don't have to fight for his love, but then we begin to exist as a product of his love. If God says, I've forgiven you, we begin to live as an individual who is forgiven, who has been set free. In Romans 6, 14 through 18, it tells us this, sin is no longer your master. For you are no longer, you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you will live under the freedom of God's grace. Well then, since God's grace has set us free from the law, does that mean we can go on sinning? Of course not. Don't you realize that you become the slave of whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. Thank God. Once you were slaves to sin, but now you wholeheartedly obey this teaching we have given you. Now you are free from your slavery to sin, and you have become slaves to righteous living. Uh, Don't misunderstand that, okay? I know slaves to righteous living, that sounds really, really constricting and overwhelming. Understand that, that Paul is speaking into the context of that culture. And he's telling them that you are free from the slavery and the bondage that you have had been controlled by. You know, if, if it owns you, there's a problem. I've often said this, if it owns you. I've talked to people before, like, I could quit smoking right now, okay? Then quit. Well, it, it's my one thing. No, if it owns you, it owns you. If you're, you know, whatever it, it is, okay? If it's your technology, if it owns you, it owns you. If it is your, um, if it's having drinks, all right? You know, if, if, if you can't see yourself sustaining a weekend with ha- having some hard drinks, it owns you. And think about it for just a minute. If you can't live without it, there's a problem. You are a slave to it. It has become your idol. It may even be a good thing. But if it is even a good thing and it has taken the place of God, then it is no longer a good thing. It's got to be God taking us and us being free. We're free from that. Being a slave. To sin is death, is death. You see, grace frees us from the enslaving sin that made us unable to be good, but it doesn't free us from our call to be good. It is by God's grace that we are empowered to do good. And it, it is, it, God's grace frees us, but God's grace gives us the strength that stands, makes us stand up and do what he has called us to do. In Romans 6, 14 through 18, in the message, it says, throw yourself, throw yourself wholeheartedly and full time. Remember, you've been raised from the dead into God's way of doing things. Sin can't tell you how to live. After all, you're not living under the old tyranny any longer. You're living in the freedom of God. So since we're out 
from under the old tyranny, does that mean that we can live any old way we uh, want? Since we're free in the freedom of God, we can do anything that comes to mind? Hardly. You know well enough from your own experiences that there are some acts of so-called freedom that destroy freedom. Offer yourselves to sin, for instance, and it's your last free act. Wow. I know I read this a, a minute ago, but listen to this in the message. If you offer yourselves to sin, for instance, it's your last free act. But offer yourselves to the ways of God and the freedom never quits. All our lives or all your lives, you let sin tell you what to do. But thank God you've started listening to a new master, one who commands um, set you one whose commands set you free to live openly in his freedom. We're rescued. We're saved by faith alone, but our faith should lead to obedience. And we don't like that word. I mean, I like using that word on my children, but we don't like that word. Obedience seems like us being managed. We've manipulated the thought of what obedience is. Obedience feels like I'm being told what to do. It feels like I'm being controlled. And here's the truth, okay? In our surrender to God through Jesus, when we begin to obey, he indeed is telling us what to do. But it is not for his own manipulative desire. He is telling you what to do because he knows that if you do what you want to do, it's going to be a mess. I thank God constantly that he interrupted patterns in my early life and brought me to my knees and asked me to begin obeying his way because the road that I was on the trajectory that I was heading for would not have resulted in having my beautiful wife, Kelly, and these four lovely children that I get to call mine. If I would have done what I wanted to, my life would have been a massive disaster. Now, I'm not saying I got it all right because I've still made minor or massive disasters along the way. But when we've been set free... When we've been released, it gives us faith to obey. That faith should lead to obedience. In the area of talking about bad religion, uh, there are some people that claim the name of Christ that there is no differentiation from the world in them. They do the same things. They act the same way. They are the same mess. They, they, you know, they, they say, I'm a Christian, and I know it's a work in progress. Don't, uh, don't misunderstand me, okay? I'm not saying that you have to be perfect immediately, but it is a change that happens in your life. Things begin to shift. Your, your, outlook, begins to, your outlook begins to see things. You begin to see things differently. The things that you used to engage in, you were you realize, i got to take a step back from that. That's not good. That's not healthy. That's not, that's not safe for me. I know that it's going to, you know, it may, be, it may be something that's pleasurable right now. You may enjoy it right now. Oh, all right. But it's going to lead to disaster. I was talking to my children the other day. Grace was asking me a question about, um, you know, we're talking about drugs. And she's like, why would you do that? Why would you do that? And I said, outright, because it feels great. She just kind of looked at me funny. I'm like, yeah, yeah. Getting drunk. I mean, I know the morning after is a hot mess. and You might be a mess. But getting drunk, it feels great. Having your equilibrium off balance. And I mean, I, I don't know about everybody. But, you know, from what I've heard and what I understand, um, being completely honest with you, it's only happened once in my life, just being completely transparent. Being drunk, it, it feels good for some. You know, you know, thinking about my dad and his heroin addiction, his heroin felt good. It allowed him to separate himself from the world. Now, I know that it became a crippling addiction that controlled him, but in the moment, it felt great. I understand that, that in the moment, there are certain things that feel wonderful. 
that are that that you just you absolutely enjoy but but they have the ability to hook us and we become slaves to it any addictions that way it could be food it could be alcohol it could be drugs it could be sex it could be anything like that it could be pride and hate and envy once once we engage it and we refuse to allow ourselves to look to god and say okay where can i gain um, balance in my life and begin to obey in this area it will ensnare you and as christians we've got to step away from those things because it's not like we're trying to be too good for everybody else, but I want people to know that I am a follower of Christ, and that means that there's something different about me. And I'm not weighing something over their head, but I'm showing them what it means to be free. Well, you don't do that stuff because they're like, oh, we're going out Friday and all that stuff. I'm like, yes, I'm going home, having pizza, hanging out with my family. You know, it's going to be awesome. And, and it's like, it's incredible because I delight in going home and spending my time with my kids as opposed to going somewhere. Right now, we, I'm not saying don't go to the bar. If you have an opportunity to minister to somebody, encourage someone, be there. But if it's, a, um, a, if it's something that's going to cause problems for you, don't do that. Don't do that. If you have a problem with something, step back from it. Ask God to lead you. Ask God to help you. Ask God to show you how to be obedient. The scripture is outlined, yes, with some things that, that feel overwhelming, but Jesus called us to freedom, and that freedom should be lived in its fullness. Not to do whatever you please, but to allow him to work in you and to change you so that you are good. And even though you still sin, it's not who you are. In fact, you don't want to sin anymore. I know that because of what he has done in me, I don't want that. I mean, I may in the flesh want it, as we say as Christians. I may crave it, but like spiritually, I'm like, that is, no, I can't, that's bad for me. It's going to cause problems. It's going to affect me negatively. We've got we've to step back and say, you know, I'm set free. God has done something marvelous. He's changed me, but I don't want that. I, I don't want to give myself to that. The gospel, the good news of Jesus, empowers us through his love to live a new and transformed life. The reborn us lives a new life. The gospel is inherently life-changing. The gospel is inherently life-changing. The gospel, the good news of Jesus, empowers us through his love to live a new and transformed life. Once you encounter Jesus in a real way and he begins to communicate with you about what needs to be adjusted, you want to chase it because you want to chase him. And you know that that change means that you will live free from the bondage and free from the slavery and free from the things that control you and hold you back and make you miserable and make you overwhelmed. I... <laughs> I want you guys to grab this because God wants you, God wants me to experience life. And that life indeed is within the boundaries that he has created for us. One of the best ways I've heard this explained is, um, is uh, the, the, the illustration of guard, guardrails. And we see them all the time out here as we're driving through um, the mountains and everything. There are guardrails. And those guardrails are there for a reason. If those guardrails weren't there, you could take a nice drive down a hill or a mountain or whatever that you had no desire to do. 
I've had friends before that I've um, heard them actually going over the side of mountains and rolling over. One of my, pa- my first pastor um, in, in a missions trip to Africa, he took a spill like that. And, and he, sh- he opened his Bible and showed me, I guess for whatever reason, during that time, uh, a lizard climbed its way into his Bible and died there. And uh, he left it there. I don't know, um, but it was nice and flat. <laughs> um, but he, he tells me this story about how when, his, when the vehicle began to flip there, the battery itself was ejected from the engine and just went flying and smacked the seat right next to him. I mean, just, he said he could hear the sound of the wind as that battery was going right by his face and head. All right, and so guardrails would have been nice to have there. And we have guardrails in place on our streets because they protect us. They protect us. That's exactly why the Bible outlines things that we should not do. Those are guardrails. Those are things that are placed there to protect us from falling off the side of a mountain. I have done things in my own life that I have, I have decided, well, I'm going to jump the rail this time, and it has caused serious pain and suffering in my life. Bad religion is expecting God's grace to free us in every moment and free us in a, in a way that we can do what we, what we want. But God, God wants to protect us. God knows the disaster that comes. God knows what it can do to us. God knows what it cost his son, Jesus to take our sin upon himself. In 1 John 4, 18, it says this, such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. If you are afraid, it is for fear of punishment. And this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. Now, in saying that, let me ask you this. What if the perfect love that expels fear of judgment also expels fear of truly living free? Because in the next verse, in verse 19 of 1 John, it says, We love because he loved us first. That is a command. That is a directive in our lives. He loves, we love. He affected us in a powerful way, so we now give ourselves, give of ourselves, sacrifice of ourselves for others. That is a command. I believe fully that being released of his judgment and that freedom also compels us to do something about it. Being freed from judgment, the fear of judgment, should also free us from the fear of of living as he has asked us to live. You can't intimately know the God of the universe and experience the extravagant grace he has poured out and yet still be convinced that your sin is not a big deal and that you've got something better going on than what he can offer you. Grace is mind-blowing. It revolutionizes our life. It shows us that God is love and God loves us. Basic, simple fact of that is not that we deserved it, not that we earned it, not that we, uh, you know, require it, not that we should have it, but that he poured himself out for us, that he gave himself for us. We didn't earn it. We didn't earn it. And that's the story of grace. And it's a million times better than the cheap, sin now, pray later mentality many of Christians settle for. Oh, shoot, I'm going to do this again. I'm gonna, oh, uh, we've whittled it and watered it down to saying, oh, I made a mistake. Okay, you can't contemplate and preconceive a mistake. Some people, they step back and they're like, okay, um, I'm going to premeditate this action, but it was a mistake. Come on. Some sins are just not on the moment kind of thing. Like you actually ponder it and deliberate about it and then act. An encounter with this grace drastically alters our life. 
The understanding of what it has accomplished for you gives you a perspective beyond just your own pleasures and habits, even more than just changing the way you view life. It changes the way you live as it works in your heart over the course of a lifetime. Over the course of a lifetime. So when Jesus changes you, we start to live more like him. We dig deeper within ourselves. We love stronger. We serve harder. We obey better. And I know that we can't necessarily muster the exact perfection of Jesus, but we strive for it. We strive for it. We go after it. God does not intend for you to be held captive by sin or by religion. He wants you to be free. He wants you to experience the fullness of life. I often tell people that I encounter that are struggling with making the shift that living God's way is so much better. It's so much better. It has so much freedom that you get to go to bed at night knowing that you've been freed You also get to go to bed at night knowing that through his grace, you did your best. And even when things bested you, you got back on your feet and you went at it again. We're not perfect, but there is no reason why we shouldn't be chasing it. As I said earlier, God's grace sees me as I am, loves me as I am, and accepts me as I am. But by grace, he doesn't leave me there. Oh, I thank Jesus every single day that he didn't leave me there. Why? Because there I was rotting in prison, captive to my own vices. Why would I go back to the hell that he freed me from? Let grace empower you to change. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for truth. We thank you for inspiring us that our lives would change. God, I pray that as we engage this message, Lord, as we think about ourselves, as we consider what we are controlled by or what you want to free us from, we would also consider what you want to free us to. That we would look back in the original text, God, that we would look at the Ten Commandments and ask you how we can enact those in our lives. God, that we would look to the Proverbs and see what wisdom looks like and what what sin looks like, and that would change us. God, that we would read, as your son Jesus said, it's not enough to not murder, but don't hate. It's not enough to not commit sexual, immoral acts. Don't lust. God, as we ponder the scripture and we think about the the. the the altitude of what you've commanded us to. Help us to know that you don't expect us to be perfect or right there, but you give us grace every day to try our hardest to get there. May your grace empower us. Thank you for coming to us as we were or as we are, but pulling us out of that mess into freedom and life. Amen.